Well, and a pleasure to start out our show with Wharton's Vitold Heinisch, who is a vice dean and faculty director of the ESG initiative here at the Wharton School. He's also a professor of management. Vit, great to talk to you again. How are you? Doing well, Don. How are you? I'm doing very well. Let's start out when we're talking about ESG larger scale, about the importance of focusing on ESG, especially in this time in, in our in our lives. Well, as we see the hurricane rip across Florida, we just get another reminder of the growing intensity of climate related events, the economic damage they can cause. And uh, if we start thinking about that, whether it's wildfires, extreme heat, uh, global warming, we need to be building that into business valuations. We need to understand what assets are going to be underwater, what assets are going to be stranded, uh, how the climate transition is going to reshape energy inputs, uh, and, and we need to be valuing that. Similarly, with uh, social justice, racial justice issues, uh, immigration issues that we've seen in the U.S. and Europe, we need to be thinking about how they affect business models uh, and, and incorporating that within valuations and within strategies. It's just that simple. ESG is uh, good business. So obviously, uh, there, there's two sides to this. There's the government side and there's the business side, and both obviously have great importance. But when I think about it, I, I think especially recently, there may even be more importance of the business side addressing a lot of this. Well, I think the ESG movement actually has historically been focused on bringing these factors into business calculations. That's been the whole idea. But you bring up a really interesting point that we kind of assume that if you buy a sovereign bond or if you buy a Philadelphia city municipal bond, you're getting something that's kind of pro-social or pro-environmental. But if we think about it a little more, I mean, that's not the case, right? Some countries are better at protecting their rainforests. Some cities are better at dealing with racial justice. One of the projects we've been working on with Morgan Stanley is to rate municipal bond issues in the United States according to ESG factors and show that just like with corporates, if you don't pay attention to ESG, you have issues in the long term. And we're starting a similar project with Brown Advisory on sovereign bonds. This is obviously getting a challenge uh, right now. There's almost kind of an anti-ESG movement out there. Uh, it, it, you, it's, and it's kind of like the political divide that we have here in the United States right now. Talk a little bit about that anti-ESG movement, if you can. Yeah, I want to push back on the idea that there's this anti-ESG movement that's somehow equivalent to the ESG movement. I mean, I know where you're coming from. It's in the press. You're reading it. DeSantis, uh, Cruz, others, Tucker Carlson are going off against woke capitalism. But, but I'm an empiricist and I'm a researcher. Let's, let's look at the data. There's $35 trillion of assets under management that say they want to understand the business case of ESG. There's about $400 million that's invested in the new funds that claim they're anti-ESG. The average ESG shareholder proposal, when they go to the vote and they try to get shareholders to say, you know, this would be a good deal, they get 30 to 40% of the votes on average, and a lot of them win. The anti-ESG votes on average, 7%, and none of them have won. It's true, 27 states have introduced legislation saying we're not going to do business with financial institutions that incorporate ESG into their business calculations. But they're not claim, they're not highlighting that that's an actual tax on their taxpayers. Our own Dan Garrett here at Wharton has done research showing that state of Texas taxpayers have already paid 300 to $500 million in higher fees because they can't do business with the biggest best, cheapest banks. They got to do business with smaller banks that have less experience issuing municipal bonds who, guess what, charge higher fees. So if we look at the data, the anti-ESG movement is largely a political stunt and political rhetoric, and it doesn't stand up to the facts. It doesn't stand up to the business case. On the one hand, you got climate risk is investment risk. What's on the other side? Climate risk isn't investment risk? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. You obviously have a lot of uh, high name, uh, high level executives that are also thinking about this uh, in terms of investment in pension funds, et cetera. Larry Fink at BlackRock really is the one that really has stood out uh, and somebody that kind of made that made that first foray. And, and I'm, I'm wondering to get your thoughts on where you think that type of activity, that type of push from those leaders, uh, either in the financial markets, wherever is going what it's going to mean for ESG moving forward. Well, it was a huge push forward. I mean, we've been talking about these issues. I've been doing research on these issues for 15, 20 years, and there are many people who have been active in the space for even longer. Uh, Parnassus Investments, maybe 25 years, making the case that we've got to think about the long-term value and think about the way, whether these strategies are sustainable. But you're absolutely right that when Larry Fink went public, I think the first time was in 2015, where his annual letter to his the CEOs of the companies in which he invests basically every publicly company, publicly traded company in the world, he shifted from talking about just governance. Are you a well-governed company? Do you have good governance practices? To starting to talk about various ESG factors. First, stakeholders, purpose. 
and most recently, climate risk is investment risk. And, and that January letter sparks a whole series of conversations, and it started bringing ESG into the mainstream. When Larry Fink, you know, the largest shareholder in most publicly traded companies in the world is saying this is real, everybody started paying attention. So I give him a lot of credit for raising the awareness of these issues. But, you know, he wasn't the originator, but right. he was the person who really brought it into the mainstream. And that's really important. Well, and I mentioned at the top about the new initiative here at the Wharton School. Tell us a little bit more about it, because from what I understand, it, it's really focusing uh, both at the undergrad and the, at the graduate level. Yeah, I mean, we believe this is part of the future of business, and, and Wharton has always wanted to be the business school that looks beyond what's currently taught and thinks ahead to train managers, to train executives, and to do the research that's going to shape the next generation. I mean, when the Wharton School was founded, there were plenty of schools that taught double entry bookkeeping, but Joseph Wharton thought we needed to do more, prove that business solves the social problems incident to our civilization. And the ESG initiative is, is just an extension of that original belief. And Erica James has lifted it uh, under her deanship to one of the top two strategic priorities of the school. We're going to do the research that looks at the when, where, and how ESG factors are material. We're not advocates for ESG. We're researchers trying to understand when, where, and how it matters. We're bringing that into the classroom. Most recently, we had an announcement that our MBA students are going to be able to major in ESG, and our undergrads are going to be able to have an ESG concentration. We're the first business school in the world to do that. We have over 30 electives that they can choose from to satisfy this major. We also offer numerous co-curricular activities where they can go out and do an impact valuation project, do an ESG consulting project. We're also going to be launching six new executive education programs next year for our graduates and other uh, you know, alumni and others who want to come back to Wharton and learn the best practices in ESG integration. And then we want to shape what's happening in industry. Our research is done in partnership with companies like Morgan Stanley, TIA, Engine Number no. One, and so it immediately gets used in practice. And then our alumni, both of our executive programs and our undergraduate and MBA programs, go off and define the future of practice. So we want to shape the way ESG is actually deployed in real time. And we also think that should shape policy. We think the SEC, the European Union, other regulatory agencies should look to us for guidance uh, as to what works and what doesn't work. And we want to be part of that conversation. So I guess there was a report that came out a while back uh, by Deloitte that said that by 2024, half of all professionally managed assets globally We'll have investments in company that consider ESG issues. That's that's a significant a statement and move forward in terms of where we're headed with this. Absolutely. I mean, the current numbers, I mean, it's great to have forecasts going forward, but the current numbers are 35 trillion or about one third of assets under management already say they want to incorporate ESG factors. And that's been growing at between 20 and 30 percent per annum slowed down a little bit this year, and happy to talk about that if we have some time. Uh, but the forecast is for continued long-term growth, and I think that's a reasonable estimate by Deloitte. Um, and, and it shows the future. If you want to get into the growing area of finance, where there's been fund inflow, where there's innovation, or if you want to look at companies uh, that are going to be growing rapidly, look for companies that are addressing the climate challenges, the social justice challenges, and making a profit, right? This isn't philanthropy. This isn't doing good. Uh, this is doing good business. Uh, so I'll have you touch on that and, and why there was a slowdown. And if the expectation is that it was a temporary one and we're going to pick up pace once again. Well, I think, look, there's been a lot of the anti-ESG movement that you talked about is seizing on the fact that ESG funds aren't doing this uh, well this year, partly because Russia invaded Ukraine. The price of oil has gone up and fossil fuel stocks have done really well. If you take the ESG movement seriously, not just the headlines, it's not just about divesting from fossil fuels. It's about incorporating ESG factors into a business valuation case, uh, into an investment thesis. No matter what your investment thesis is, when Russia invaded Ukraine and the price of oil and gas went up, oil and gas stocks are going to do better. So, you know, it, it, it's not, it, the idea isn't that we divest now and we change the planet overnight. It's just that we correctly value these things. If we correctly value them, we're going to be fracking more for the next couple of years than we would have before Russia invaded Ukraine. There's nothing inconsistent about that with the ESG movement. There are going to be periods where you outperform, periods that you underperform. The question is about the long-term performance. Uh, and there, I'm really confident that the ESG movement is on the right track. And, and uh, offerings like Rise or Drill, which just are really heavy on oil and gas, they can't survive into the future. There's no way that those stocks are going to be profitable. They're going to have terminal values. They're going to be shut down 2030 or 2050. 
but for this year, they look good. So there, there is some contention this year, and we have to be more sophisticated than just saying no fossil fuels or divest now. We have to think about which fossil fuel companies are ahead of the transition, which ones are getting ready for that, and which ones aren't, and really distinguish between them. So, so I think the, the slowdown this year highlights that the quick wins, the quick solutions in the ESG movement, just cutting out a couple stocks or using a simple formula aren't good enough. We've got to be more sophisticated. And at the ESG Initiative at the Warden School, we want to contribute to that. Vic, great to have you with us, and uh, thank you for your time today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Vithold Heinz, who is uh, Vice Dean and Faculty Director for the ESG Initiative here at the Wharton School.